time to march ahead with our next panel discussion as well. Uh, they often say that uh, what you do for yourself leaves with you when you leave the world. What you do for the others remains immortal. On that note, our next topic is beyond our role as architects. And uh, we have with us our session moderator, who would be responsible to extract the perspectives from the fellow panel members. He's a graduate in architecture and actively involved both in his profession as well as in academics, as a visiting faculty in the Goa College of Architecture since 1987. Partner and principal architect in, mos in mosaic design and has designed around India over 250 houses, 50 hotels, 30 housing complexes in about 30 institutions, offices, and factories. So ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I'd like to invite on stage Mr. Dean De Cruz, Mosaic Goa. Let's have a round of applause to welcome Mr. Dean De Cruz. And now joining uh, Mr. De Cruz on the stage, I'd now like to invite our next set of speakers. May I please invite Ms. Tanuja Kanvande, Kanvande Rai, and Chaudhary, New Delhi. Please put your hands together for Mr. Zarir Mulan, Zarir Mulan, architect and interior designer, Mumbai. Welcome, sir. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sanjay Patil, Environ Planners, Nasik. And let's have a round of applause from all the corners of the hall, everyone. Moving on to our next speaker as well. Let's invite on stage Mr. Shekhar Ganthi, GA Design Consultants, Mumbai. And our final speaker for the panel discussion, Mr. Abhin Alam Chandani, SDUP Consultants, Mumbai. Please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Alam Chandani as well as all our speakers. All right. So our ever-smiling panel members are all set for our next panel discussion. I'd like to request our session moderator, Mr. Dean De Cruz, to please take it over from here. Over to you, sir. Yeah, very good afternoon to you all. I hope it's not too loud. Um, <clears throat> for today's panel discussion, we thought we'd keep it light. Uh, there's been a lot of architecture, a lot of interior design, but what really drives us is extremely important. What, what our personal lives are, what, we, what passions we follow. And uh, so that so we thought that we could just talk of something beyond architecture. Um, the field of architecture, of course, is extremely fascinating. In fact, when I had a discussion briefly with uh, the group over here and they asked them, you know, something beyond architecture, they said, we don't get time <laughs> to really do too much beyond architecture. But it's these little things that actually uh, that are beyond our typical profession. Yeah, I think there's a massive echo taking place. If, if you could just cut down the echo, please. Yeah? Um, so what really drives us is extremely important and influences our architecture as well. Uh, do we have a slides? Each one of us will be presenting a few slides on, on what really um, we do beyond architecture and uh, share with you our own personal journeys in, in different ways. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd start first. I mean, a, a couple of months ago on The Economist, uh, which is a fairly well-read magazine, uh, there was an article on robotics uh, and how robotics is going to change the world uh, today. Uh, in fact, they said that robotics, uh, through, the, through the sort of uh, technology, information technologies that you have, uh, even the profession of doctors is actually under threat because the whole diagnostic processes actually offer far greater accuracy through these electronic diagnostic, diagnostics. Uh, and uh, they said that in, in about uh, 20 to 30 years, about 50% of the jobs as we know today uh, would have changed. And, uh, they gave a list of uh, various professions which will actually be needed uh, for the future. And topping that list was architects and designers. And if you'd I found that very strange initially. But they're not looking at architects and designers merely from the point of view of people who design buildings or interiors or spaces or objects, uh, but people who can think, uh, who have uh, compassion for society, people who uh, are visionaries, basically. And that's what we need in the world today, people who can actually think beyond what, what we have normally. What, how can we improve the world? How can we actually make a difference? Uh, as architects, we're taught 
to order, to put things in order, and for the future that we have with this vast incoming technologies, I think we have a great opportunity as architects and designers to actually change the world in a big way. So I'll share with you my little journey, starting off as, of course as, as a regular architect, and how I diversified little in different areas. Yeah. Uh, next, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, this is that. Next, okay, great. Yeah. Um, about 10 years ago, I mean, we were normal practice, and uh, there was a new regional plan coming up in, in Goa. And being an architect, of course, we're used to sort of understanding what mapping is all about. And we realized it was a massive scam, you know, a big land scam. So uh, a group of us architects got together and we said, this is not on, so let's, let's make it public. So we did the mapping, we, we called for people to come to the streets. Uh, we did a multi-pronged, we took, took a legal uh, stance as well, took it to court. And uh, eventually the regional plan got scrapped. And as punishment for stopping the regional plan, uh, I was put on a new committee along with Charles Correa and Edgar Ribeiro to actually prepare the new regional plan for Goa. And I'm not a trained planner, but it suddenly put me in a completely different uh, area of expertise, uh, which I didn't have, but something which I slowly learned a lot about. And, and planning is really a macro sort of stage of architecture. And understanding what planning is about, creating participative planning, going down to grassroots level, using whatever technologies, whether it's Google or other uh, mapping technologies that are available, we actually started preparing this plan, which, which took about four or five years but extremely sort of enlightening process uh, that we had. Uh, besides, of course, uh, the macro level of, of design, uh, our office, which is Mosaic, which is uh, basically it's a mosaic of design disciplines ranging from planning to product design to graphic design, uh, also designs objects. So, of course, we, uh, we do a lot of the IFB machine designs, all the Crompton Green, new lights, fans, uh, but we also do little things which try and make an ecological difference. So little garbage strikes, uh, composting stations, uh, using, uh, designing sort of kitchenware, uh, lighting in various things. So we have a great amount of fun to actually diversifying in the micro level of uh, design. And this really lends the detail that we need into our architecture. So we're able to actually take architecture to another level uh, where our detailing actually is used. Uh, um, <clears throat> I'm also, for the past uh, 20 years, a member of the Goa Foundation. The Goa Foundation, if most of you don't know, is really an environmental advocacy, advocacy group. Uh, we file a number of cases on the environment. A lot of the landmark cases are uh, on CRZ, on forests around India that have affected and protected areas around India. Uh, one of the latest uh, sort of successes was stopping mining in Goa, where we actually stopped and, of course, spelt out as a 35,000 crore scam. So the Go Foundation actually sort of does these things. We're continuing this battle. Uh, it's an uphill task, but we actually... So I help in terms of actually analyzing data, mapping it, and taking it forward. Yeah. I'm also part of the Go Heritage Action Group, which looks as pre preserving the environment, both built and natural heritage. And more recently, part of the AP. Uh, all these years have been completely apolitical. But I realized that I, to make a difference, actually, I needed to get off that fence and actually take a decision. So I'm working on policy right now with the AP in Goa. So how do we actually, I know the AP may be controversial at times, and it's, it's a fledgling party. But I believe that our expertise as architects and designers can actually uh, help these organizations understand what are the real issues and what are the real policies that can make a difference to people. Uh, at the age of 50, um, Right up till then, I suffered from uh, a fear of heights. I mean, I could go to the edge of a building and I'd virtually just look down almost on my knees. Uh, and I said, I have to get over it. And the only way to get over it is to learn to fly. So at the age of 50, I, I learned uh, paragliding, and I'm an official uh, uh, pilot, uh, and paragliding only. And it was just an exhilarating experience. And I realized that you have to let go. And the, when we as architects tend to sort of, you know, have a very sort of uh, very sort of pressurized timelines in what we do. Uh, about five years ago, um, we decided our office decided no more houses for the rich. Uh, we've done a number of houses, a number of very embarrassing houses like Vijay Malia's, and uh, we decided that 
we have to get out of this. And from an office of 36, making that decision, we, of course, went down to 12. But that suddenly freed up a lot more time uh, that I had on my hands. And I started taking up these little hobbies. Yeah. I also have a fear of depth. You know, if my feet don't touch uh, the ground when I'm swimming, I, I really get scared. Uh, but my daughter is a, is a coral reef conservationist. She's a certified diver. And she's actually certified to even build underwater uh, artificial reefs. Yeah. Uh, so my next venture is going to go under the sea and dive. So next, we're going to have, um, who's next? Uh, Sorry. OK. No, I think they've got it in separate ones here. So Zari is next. And uh, we'll have this brief presentation of each one of us, and then we can open it up for discussion. Yeah. Good evening. That was wonderful, Dean. Uh, I think I need to shift to Goa. In Mumbai, I find myself with almost no time at all. Yeah. Like I was saying, uh, in Mumbai, we find ourselves uh, with no time at all. I. Uh, seem to be running from pillar to post, project to project, and probably three days in Mumbai, three days out of Mumbai. So I find uh, very little time for myself or any of my hobbies or pursuits. In fact, uh, reflecting back on my college days, uh, I used to participate a lot in outdoor activity of all kinds. And as time, time flew by and as the practice grew, I guess one by one, each of the hobbies were dropped. So being an architect is tough. Uh, we're a first generation office, so pretty much most of my time goes into, uh, into the office and building it up. So just a few slides at the back. Uh, even, uh, because of the nature of our work, uh, we do a lot of high-end homes. And in the country that we practice, as an architect, uh, we find ourselves being drawn into playing the roles of people who we are not probably supposed to be playing. We, we are not only architects to a project, we, we take up the roles of uh, project management, we take up the roles of the engineer, we take up the roles of the site supervisor. Uh, the, the concept of the, the architect needs to design and you have, you have a variety of other professionals. Uh, who back them up on various projects to undertake various responsibilities probably has not seeped in completely here, at least not for the, uh, the end user who's doing homes. Uh, it, may, it may be the case for uh, hotel projects and larger commercial projects, but when you are doing uh, private projects for uh, the end user, it seems like the architect is playing, uh, donning more than one hat at a time. So. Uh, nothing inspiring like what Dean has said. Uh, whatever time I have left, I try to spend with my family. That's pretty much it. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Sanjay Patil. I'm from Nasik. And uh, I was fortunate that uh, I was not a very bright student. And so I could not get a job in any good offices in Mumbai. Neither or I got admission for my PG or uh, I went abroad where the al almost I went to Nasik uh, and rather than <coughs> sticking in Mumbai, uh, Nasik is a much better place to practice and to have your own quality of life. And uh, so this, this is a p uh, place where which I bought uh, say 25 years back and so uh, this is a this was a land absolutely barren land, and uh, so this is a land. You can see the first image. You can see the second image, and now this is the third image where almost we have uh, planted 4,000 trees, and uh, now it's totally um, full green uh, with lot of green cover, and uh, it's really a great contribution I feel to my mind, and it's really a place where you can unwind yourself. Other uh, activities that I enjoy is the uh, trekking, touring, and the latest one is the jogging, which I started just few few months back. 
I was not able to uh, jog even for a few, un few uh, hundred meters. But now I am, uh, I've done 10K challenge race uh, within a qualifying time. I have also done uh, 15 kilometers in hill run. And now we are hoping to qualify in this uh, CMM, uh, Bombay Marathon, 21 kilometers. So that's, that's the thing which we are, you know, enjoying other than architecture. Touring is also my passion, which I, I enjoy a lot. Uh, people always ask and wonder uh, how I'm doing, what I'm doing, whether uh, I'm doing really job or not. So, and these are the other areas where we enjoy music. Um, I think you can see me on the left-hand side corner when I was in college, as accompanying the sitarist. And uh, these are the various uh, activities which happen in our farmhouse where music uh, classes are happening, uh, courses, and then we have a discussions with, on drama, music, then there are painting demonstrations. So all these activities that are happening and that is really enriching our life. And that is what I feel uh, other than architectural scope we are enjoying. Can we have uh, Tanuja's presentation, please? You know, Dean sent us this message. He said, share some slides with us. Something which bothers you, something which gives you joy. And what you do beyond as an architect started thinking. Do we really do anything beyond the role of an architect? You know, I said, started listing out things. I said, yeah, I teach. I'm very actively involved in the Institute of Indian Interior Designers for the last five years, which has made me an event manager. Okay. But uh, beyond that, what? I counsel students, but then that's again leading to architecture. So then we started, you know, I, I said, let me look at pictures which I've taken over the years and then went back. But before I go on to what I do otherwise, I share these few slides, which is essentially about lack of civic sense in our ever-growing urban environment. We all live in cities. What we choose to see is really the beautiful parts of the city, but we are living with a lot of squalor, dirt, rhyme, and which is all largely due to our own lack of civic sense. And this is something which I think we need to address, whether it's at a small uh, city level, town, mega cities, whatever. The next slide is, I couldn't help but put this, save Kodugu or Kug. That's where I come from. So something which has really bothered me is the way the government is promoting, bulldozing through the heritage of the place itself, promoting tourism with no concern whatsoever. The recent uh, Kaveri dispute that's been happening, River Kaveri starts from Kug. For some, most of you might be aware of it, but we've just finished the monsoons and there is no water in the wells. Normally, the monsoon replenishes the subsoil water level, the wells come up, but today there is no water. So if the wells are dried up after a monsoon, you know what we are heading towards later on. The last slide below is about changing social values. Our office is in Connaught Place, and for some of you, it must be uh, you know, a vision of Latians Delhi and beautiful and all of that. But what we see today is really the slide at the bottom left. It's full of pubs and it's full of underaged students from schools who come and this is in the daytime and the office building where we are functioning for the last 50 years is gradually taken over. We had a pub in the ground floor, now it's on the second floor, and very soon we'll be out, but that's the changing scenario. So we are kind of giving in very easily to where the West left. 
These are things which have really bothered me. And of course, the headlines that you see here about the safety and security of the cities that we live in and what we are leaving for our next generations. On the other hand, there are lots of things that I love doing. You know, interacting with people. I've had the good fortune of meeting with a lot of modern masters in architecture and as a result also extensions of, you know, Mayendraj and people like them who are truly inspirational. They belong to a different level, a different category and to know them at a personal level and see them work and to work with them has really made a huge difference. Travel, I think most architects love traveling and that's where we learn. Travel to different places. Trekking was a great favorite during my younger days. As you can see in the picture there, like Shraddha said, no, we couldn't recognize you, you know, I don't know who you are. So <laughs> that's what that is. I also spent time community development. So, you know, help develop environment around where we live. Gardens, parks, integrate rainwater harvesting with it develop uh, community centers. So there is a lot of community activity which one does. Of course, performing arts is something which I, which relaxes me. I'd love to have music on when I'm working or when I'm really agitated. What really calms me is music. And uh, this is basically at our own home in Delhi. And Delhi being a place, the cultural hub, there is no dearth for functions, performances, and that's really something which I take complete advantage of. Greenery, environment, gardening, these are all things from my own home. Cooking, I love eating, you can see it from my, you know. So cook, traditional recipes I'm very fond of, but I do cook other things as well, so that's what I do other than, you know, practice and teach and... Okay, we'll next have Shekhar. Hello, everybody. Um, any, uh, my name is Shekhar Ganti. Any students in the group here? Anybody with raise of hands? Uh, no students? Okay, any architects at the back here? Are we the only architects here talking about architecture and beyond and nobody's listening? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, my slides are more on the fun side, light side. Uh, I just thought probably it's the noon session, everybody will be dozing, so I just try to make it a little more lighter. And uh, this is the way to go forward, yeah, this one. Uh, to me, the, uh, when uh, the panel came up with the discussion topic of uh, architecture and beyond architecture, it's a very interesting topic. Um, I, well, I studied architecture and uh, went abroad. I, I, I've been living there since 1994. I uh, worked with Richard Meyer. Uh, he's a very famous architect for almost 13 years as a senior designer. And uh, my wife, she's a lighting designer. But architecture doesn't stop there. It's a very broad profession. You just don't have to pigeonhole yourself uh, into thinking about just architecture. So this is the vision when I was a kid. Uh, I said, okay, I want to be an architect. And uh, often even everybody knows God is considered architecture of this world. So that's a funny snap of Jesus saying, hey, I'm an architect too. Well, it goes on. Um, what I want to carry the message is uh, we as architects don't have to restrict ourselves uh, only to buildings. It's a very vast profession. And nowadays you realize that uh, vastu, I mean, even if, you're, uh, if you realize your designs are not passing because this guy, the client is all insisting on vastu, just pretend to be a vastu consultant for a day. How does it matter? I mean, just uh, you can tell him anything and he'll believe you. If uh, you cannot get your designs uh, approved by a client, just say that due to Vastu, this is great. This is the best planning due to Vastu. And if he knows more about Vastu, just confuse him more. This is, uh, this is Feng Shui. And I'm sure he doesn't know about Feng Shui and Vastu at the same time. So you can uh, go through that. 
So uh, architecture is a vast profession. You can really, this is, this is a funny thing I always get asked, uh, oh, you're an architect, uh, do you know Hafiz contractor? And this usually, uh, most non-architects uh, we meet in a pub or, or somewhere else will ask you this question. So yeah, we are reckoned by that name. Um, it's a funny uh, uh, clip of, uh, it's not fire rated, I tested it. Uh, it's a kid trying to test our design. And that everybody is familiar with. It's the Indian scenario where the carrot hanging always happens. Okay, we, we'll give you more projects. Don't expect fees. Uh, um, don't worry, don't worry. I mean, fees is coming, okay? And I've never seen it come. But don't worry, there is a carrot, and I'm tired of eating carrots, uh, so. Uh, uh, so this is always the first question I ask my accountant uh, when, he, uh, when the client says, oh, start project, where is the schema? I ask him the question, uh, did we get the retainer? And the answer is always no. So uh, how is that the, we architects can pull on architecture uh, especially in India, I mean, you can't even sue the client. But uh, I really like working with the Indian clients because uh, they won't sue you. They can get you killed, but they won't sue you. That's because <laughs> suing is too expensive, it takes too much time. So I like practicing in India better. So uh, even if I don't, if we get half my fee, I'm okay with it because at least I won't get sued for the rest of the year. Uh, and that's Philip John. <laughs> It's uh, finally a Pritzker, so all of you guys who want to be 80 years old and then win a Pritzker prize, or posthumously when you're dead, uh, you get a prize, you're recognized for your work. So, and that's, I'm burnt out. Uh, that's an in short a story of a life of an architect. It's not all bad, don't worry, we are all enjoying. Uh, you can still see us smile and have fun. Um, I think it's a really vast profession and there is so much to do. And uh, I got bored once uh, while I was in Los Angeles and I said, okay, I had enough of architecture. I want to do something new. So there I was, there was no Indian restaurant there. So I started a restaurant and for 10 years I owned that restaurant and I ran it. So you can be anything you want. So don't pigeonhole yourself. That's my message today. Thank you. And up next. Hello. Okay, you know, so before my uh, presentation goes on, I don't have the, you know, I just wanted to respond to something Zareev said about being in this busy city where you spend a lot of time just moving from your office to your site and a lot of time in traffic as well. Uh, you know, I had an interesting episode, you know, sometime a, a hospital that I designed on a Friday night, I was supposed to be traveling the Monday. I wasn't feeling too well, so I said, I'll go for a checkup if I'm going to be overseas for a long time. This guy takes my ECG. I designed the hospital, not the machine, mind you. There was something wrong with the machine. They put me into the ICU. Now, I landed up in the ICU being a Friday night. The guy said, I'll check you out only on Monday. So, and you have to be there anyway for 48 hours or whatever. So I was in the ICU out there, and then after my office guys found out that this guy is really not going to go beyond everything, besides beyond architecture. Okay, they then send me a get well card, okay? And behind the get well card was a brief for a competition. So I was sitting out there, you know, what the Zari is saying, designing, you know, uh, a, a kind of a project for an IT park. And then when the nurse and all came, I said, just wait, wait, wait. You know, I've, I've got to finish this sketch and send it out. So this is the life of an architect. So, I mean, what do you think beyond architecture? But you know what's happening with me in particular is that due to my circumstances, I think I am spending a lot of time beyond architecture anyway. And the message that I carry is like this is a full circle. What you do beyond architecture, you do in architecture because that kind of brings you into the circle of architecture itself. Because it's such an, it's, it's a way of in, interpreting the world around you, right? So the more you know of the world, the better connected you will be as an architect. So that's one of the things I'd like to say. Uh, the rest of it, I got to figure how to work this. Uh, the green one, the top green one. Okay. So, you know, first thing I'd like to say is that, you know, something that I think is that architecture itself is very loosely defined. Is it architecture? I love art. I love sculpture. And I was a confused kid. You know, I didn't know what really I wanted to do. Was it art? Was it sculpture? Was it architecture? 
And actually, what I wanted to do uh, is philosophy. I love philosophy, you know. And uh, I love, basically by philosophy, I mean critical thinking, you know. So uh, that's where, you know, this whole Latin term, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, okay, is basically the existence of any human being on Earth is basically the sum of his conscious existence, okay? And so this is something that kind of drives me. The, the idea that architecture has a boundary, sculpture has a boundary, art has a boundary, and somewhere dancing at the boundary of all this, okay, you find meaning in your life. And if I really go and show you, I mean, how that works, I'll show you how that works with me. Uh, spend a lot of my time traveling, uh, you know, a lover of Western art, I dabble in painting and art myself. I believe architecture has five dimensions, length, breadth, height, time. And the uh, dimension most critical to me in my architecture is the dimension of the question mark, meaning, which is for me the fifth dimension of architecture. So I try to find meaning and I try to give meaning in the work that I do. And art helps me because it allows me to see things in different perspectives. Uh, it allows me to see future histories, it makes me understand that truth is relative. When I read what India and Pakistan are discussing today in the news, I wonder what the hell is really happening, you know? So uh, really, there are parallel realities. There are different perspectives. It's a lot like cubism. It's a lot like deconstructivism, you know? And the more you realize about the plurality of the world around you, the better you'll be in understanding your clients, the design, the brief, and being able to deliver as an architect. So beyond architecture, Look at the world around you, nature. I'm just showing you some of my work, and I don't need to say much. We've talked about leaves today, I believe. And uh, I love diving, and uh, that's something we can do together. There's a great dive site near Goa, uh, near Sindhudurg. I love, um, you know, I think so this is one of my, and it comes around full circle. It works in my architecture as well. That's an air, airport I'm designing in Lakshwadeep, you know, inspired by my diving experiences. I love technology. I mean, I, I kind of, uh, one of the reasons why I run an engineering organization is I love the tech. I love the idea of taking things, breaking them into components, putting them together again, seeing what new technologies will work. But I think what's important is to also have a sense of humor, you know, with all these technology, you know? And uh, for example, there was a client of mine who had no space in the site and insisted on putting a building and having very small setbacks, and then having 40 trees. So besides putting some trees on the roof of his building, which was the space that I could find, okay, we also managed to design for him something called a solar tree. You see that thing out there, okay, which was basically a photovoltaic tree. It's a very futuristic building. I'll show you the building. It had got photovoltaics on the facade. Uh, that's not working, I think. One second. Yeah, there it goes. That's the building. It's in New Delhi. Um, I believe. Uh, today, day to day, I'm running an organization which has got a lot of engineers. I mean, we've got about a thousand engineers, about 300 architects. So it's a 2,000 man company, okay? And it goes across beyond architecture to, uh, you know, building services, project management. So I wear many different hats. I have to wear many different hats. In fact, some people tell me I'm a lawyer, you know, because I look at con I have to look at contracts day to day, you know, and I spend something like 50% of my day okay, looking at, okay, the business of business, right? And then the balance 50% actually doing the, uh, you know, practicing the profession. Thankfully, I love people like Leonardo da Vinci, you know, or Satyajit Ray. They are my, uh, the people I used to love because I believe they are complete. They are people who could do many different things and explore many dimensions of their being. So, uh, building bridges between disciplines, and it helps me. I can design bridges because as an architect, I believe that's a very sad thing in India, that they don't ask architects to come and design these large urban projects. So uh, I believe that these are kilometers long, our buildings are small and insignificant contributions, you know, in comparison. And architects have a lot to contribute to these projects. And I'm really glad that recently they've been insisting on architectural intervention into some of these large urban projects. Um, so this is something very interesting. This is what happened. This bridge that you see out here is the bridge to Amravati that we are designing for Chandra Babu Naidu. And the one above is a bridge on the Sabarmati. Now that's a pedestrian bridge. So that sense of humor, why not put a roller coaster? 
why only the bridge? And the roller coaster is structural, by the way. It's a truss, you know? But we are using the top boom of the truss, okay, as a roller coaster, and we made the bridge into an amusement park itself. You know, so it, it's, a, it's a question of uh, how you look at it. And, you know, and uh, now here's a project very, very controversial, and that's why I say this is the famous coastal road project. And uh, here, what's an architect's role in the coastal road project? I think if an architect doesn't play a role in the coastal road project, you really had it. You know, uh, it started as an engineering project. There were a lot of public criticism. So we got our architectural team. We convinced the municipal commissioner that although it's a highway design assignment given to us, we want to actually intervene and give an urban plan to it. So actually, we've converted the outlook of the project from being a coastal road to a western waterfront development project. This is something that we've done. It's just tendered out. It's about 38 kilometers long. And the one interesting thing about this project you know, when I, this has got to do with beyond architecture, actually, because when we were in college, we actually had to, we had a design exercise to redesign, to design something. They didn't tell us what. They said, design something on marine drive. And they gave this as a three-day exercise to us. And most of the students were really confused because they didn't give a brief. And they said, make a design on marine drive. This is a three-day SK. And really, I went two, three times down the uh, marine drive, and it's, one of the things that defines the character of Mumbai. And I told myself, actually, you shouldn't be doing anything. So one of the things beyond architecture is to sometimes look at a site and say, no, I don't want to do this site. I don't want to do this uh, project. Actually, what I said is that Marine Drive, the beauty of it is the different ways in which the land actually touches the sea. So what happens is sometimes the, if, if, if you're walking along a coast, which is straight, and the sea is straight, and, you're, and, you're, and one eye is looking at the sea to the right, and one eye, let's say, to the left, there's a tension within you. If you walk along a coast which is concave, or a waterfront which is concave, you have a different feeling. If it's convex, you have a different feeling. So by just slightly altering the way a landform meets another landform, you will get more architecture into it, because the way you see the city, the different perspectives with which you see the city, will change. So that's really what we try to bring into even something like the Coastal Road Project. First, we try to take the road off. We try to make a large footpath which connects South Mumbai to North Mumbai, which we don't have, a cycle track, which again connects it, and change the way the project would be seen as. So I think architects must start thinking cities and linking communities. These are things that we can do because we are generalists. You know, we can look at these things in this larger context. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, so therefore, uh, although I work in a company which does all kinds of things from nuclear containment shell structures to environmentally and sustainable buildings, uh, I kind of find an interest in all these different type technologies. I believe they all simultaneously exist. Nothing is bad unless you do it in a wrong way. And you must actually try and understand these things and try to do as much right and as much good with it as possible. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Uh, <clears throat> I think who we are today is, is shaped by uh, our little dreams as, as youngsters and what we wanted to be. I remember this uh, interview with uh, Zuvan Mehta's mum, and uh, this TV person asked her, so, you know, did Zuban have a dream? And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, Zuban had a dream, and, and then, uh, you know, you... Every, but every little child has a dream. They want to be a pilot. They want to be a fire engine driver. And my Zubin wanted to be a bus driver. But at least he became a conductor. <laughs> um, so I'd like to ask the panelists what your dream was and how it probably shaped you. Uh, my dream was to be a racing car driver. And those who drive with me today will see that the passion still exists. Um, <clears throat> therefore, I drive an electric car today, and I've still got a speeding ticket with that as well. Uh, so what's your dream? <clears throat> well, honestly, I dreamt of being an architect. Uh, that was after the ninth standard. Um, I was very fond of horse riding. So as a kid, I mean, much younger, I'm talking about the time when I was probably 10 or 11 years of age, and I used to be riding at the race course. And I always saw these military personnel riding around, playing polo, tent pegging. And I just thought to myself that this must be, this is a blissful life. 
I mean, you get paid for it, you get free food, and you're riding around all day. So at, at, at that young, tender age, I thought I might join the army. I'm glad I didn't. And an architect I am. Well, it changed many times uh, since you're a kid. Um, but the thing is, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So my dad used to always say, there is no course for entrepreneurship. I said, there must be. I mean, I'm, I want to be an entrepreneur because I hated to be any one profession, an engineer or architect. But uh, my dad was from JJ College of Architecture, Fine Arts. Uh, he was a professor there. So one thing led to the other, and I ended up into architecture. But what I realized was, like I said, Architecture is a very broad profession. You can be so many things. You can be a film director. You could be a, uh, you can conduct a, a lot of design, product designs, because it teaches you to think out of the box. So here I am. I own multiple businesses, and I think uh, I have fulfilled my dream as an entrepreneur. Why should we be an architect? You can be anybody. <laughs> gotcha. I don't think I started with a dream. I mean, except that I wanted to do something to do with drawing because my grandfather was a drawing teacher, so that was my only... I definitely didn't want to do medicine at that point of time. But it's another thing that I spent at least 10 days a month as a caregiver in addition to whatever else I'm doing. So that's like a full-time caregiver thing. But I do dream a lot of things now, and now I want to do a lot more things. Actually, there was no dream. After uh, matriculation, you have to choose certain side. So my inclination was uh, to become a doctor. But then somebody told me that you, uh, you should have this, uh, that test where you can understand your uh, likings in profession, future profession. So we went to, first time we, I came to Bombay and there was some uh, institute where they, there was some questionnaire and, and I have to answer that. And then they, uh, there the result was that you can become a doctor also, but you can also become an architect. And that triggered the idea to become an architect. And so, so that was not through a dream, but it was a kind of this kind of accident. So, you know, I always wanted to be in the uh, profession of uh, something creative like architecture and engineering. So, you know, it's not in terms of profession that I had a dream. My real dream was actually to explore the full dimension of my own self. So what I wanted to do was, uh, so, you know, it's something that I'm perpetually dreaming again and again, right? Because you can't do that. You can't actually achieve that. So, and as long as you can't achieve that, you're good, you know, because then there's more to you, okay, to be uh, discovered. So, I don't know, sometimes I feel that this whole architecture thing is like a comet, you know, it's going to go whiz, because, you know, I, when I started the profession, at that time there was Mr. Kanwinde, there was uh, Mr. Stein, there was Mr. Doshi, these were the big guys, and you aspired, oh yes, as an architect, I'd like to, you know, one day compete in a competition where these guys are all involved, et cetera, et cetera. But then as you go, keep going on into the profession and you saw what happened afterwards and uh, different players came and today we are in a global market and all that sort of stuff. Okay, you've done that. You, you thought you'd do maybe one hotel, one house, one uh, you know, palatial building or whatever, whatever. Now you've done all that, then what happens? So then you realize that this is like an inward journey. You know, you've got to look at exploring more dimensions of yourself. Let me tell you, as an, a dream of an architect was to do three good buildings. I think I haven't achieved the first one, so I've got so many more to do. Okay. On the other hand, I have kind of feel that this dream, you know, wasn't really the good dream. The good dream was to actually look at what I have to grow into, what I have to be. So maybe we'll, I'll become a film director, God knows, you know, next. So it's, it's a perpetual quest, I, I feel, you know. I think Shekhar brought up an interesting point on uh, being an entrepreneur. And uh, there are a lot of architects that we friends that I know who are architects who are quite frustrated with the profession at times so, because you're constantly battling for the fees, as you showed. 
And uh, you know, you really actually, at the end of the day, make, make very little money as, as compared to a lot of other professions today. Um, there was a story of this uh, architect in America who won a million dollar prize, and they went and interviewed him, and they said, you know, okay, what are you gonna do with it? He says, I'm gonna plow to my practice and lose that as well. So it's, I mean, it's a profession that's extremely tough, especially with, with the situation that we have uh, in India. And uh, do you think architects as an entrepreneurs is really a working model? Yes, it is. It's a business after all, right? I mean, every business, uh, including architecture, is a business. And what they should be teaching at the architecture school is business and not drawing. I mean, uh, even Tado Ando is a boxer, but he's an architect. I mean, he's a great architect. I mean, you need to learn business. At the end of the day, what makes sense is, okay, are you successful in what you're doing? And the only way you can be successful is uh, learning the art of managing money and trying to be an ent uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, it's a very important thing. Art is very important, no doubt about it. You need to create beautiful, you should be sensitive uh, to, but being an entrepreneur, uh, you can be many things of the same thing. But that doesn't mean that you don't care about people. You still do. I mean, you still have a lot of values for what you do. But you can still be, like Elon Musk is a very good example. I mean, he's, he's an entrepreneur. He's doing amazing stuff, the Tesla, the space rockets. And that's inspirational to me. I mean, he's being very creative at the same time, but he's an entrepreneur too. So I think it is, it is possible. Um, the world today is, is faced with a lot of strife. We see uh, issues of social injustice around the world. We see, we see issues of uh, uh, environmental damage, climate change, which are very serious threats. Uh, unfortunately, the world of architecture is actually contributed uh, very little to this. Yeah? Uh, but we as architects, people who are really concerned uh, about this, uh, need to do something about. So I'm going to ask panelists, if, what do you think really needs to be done and how can we contribute as architects uh, to uh, issues that are taking place around the world? You know, I, I feel that we really need to awaken people. You know, I think generally the public are very receptive, they're bright, except that maybe we are a little more geared to, we see what, uh, you know, environment degradation has done and what it's going to do. We are very aware of what the consequences are. So I think we need to just come out of our shells, come out beyond of our practices and interact initially with the public and then get, all of us together need to get to the politicians and the bureaucrats, because at the moment, the, complete, the country is completely overrun by decisions which are made at that level with no consideration whatsoever to how we live as people. There is absolutely no consideration. And this I'm saying even in small towns, I mean, it's happening in Delhi, it's happening in Mumbai, it's happening in Bangalore. I mean, you all of us have seen people plowing through existing residences, and this has all happened out of carelessness. I mean, and I think we, are, we cannot really let this happen meaninglessly. We have to come out, and I think in some manner we need to be activists. I think uh, uh, I'm not that public person, but I started from my own uh, efforts or initiatives. First thing is that uh, uh, making our earth green. Uh, I deliberately see that uh, all of all uh, all of our projects they have a wonderful landscape. We have. Uh, I'm proud to say that almost we have planted 20,000 trees and which are fully grown in our city. Uh, that is one number one. As far as the uh, Every client is concerned, we educate them or we insist them that you should recycle your waste, kitchen waste, and it, it starts from there. So almost uh, all the clients are now adopting that system. We are, everybody is recycling their uh, waste, kitchen waste and other. Third thing that we are in our, uh, even the, uh, like any other uh, festivals, we create a lot of the, dirt and garbage and everything. So 
we try to clear at our level best. We try to clear our uh, monuments. We pick up all these plastic bags and all that. After the Ganesh festival, we clear our the place where uh, where people make a lot of dirt and clutter. So that is the initiative that we on our own do it. And that, 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 that is where I think you start from your own system. Then people will follow you. Uh, how much time do we have left? Uh, OK, with 10 minutes left. Uh, should we open it up to the audience to ask some questions? Or, yeah. So anyone else from the audience is free to ask us uh, even embarrassing questions. Um, please feel free to. In the meantime, you, could, you want to comment on what, how you could contribute to? Uh, no, one of the points that I wanted to make was uh, we definitely need to sensitize our society. Uh, we lack even civ civic sense, basic civic sense and sensibilities. There are times when I'm driving from one part of Bombay to another and it's deplorable what you see on the roads, the, uh, the lack of civic sense, I mean, things which you take for granted that any educated society would adhere to. But I mean, we've, got, we've got a huge struggle in front of us. I mean, environment, sustainability, green architecture, all that is fine. I mean, we firstly got to educate our public. We've, we've uh, got to start at the grassroots. There are so many people from, uh, who are not from urban developments. They're from villages, they're from uh, smaller towns. Probably they don't know how they need to behave. Surprisingly, there are sometimes educated people from the urban context who don't know how to behave. So it's, it's a struggle for society as I see it right now. I mean, the things you read in the newspaper, every day you open the newspaper, it's, it's gross. It's, it's a sad state. I, I, I don't know where to begin in this, uh, this kind of a scenario and how many years it will take us to educate, sensitize, and create some sort of civic awareness within the people in the society. And until that doesn't improve, nothing else can. That's my take. Uh, Shekhar, you've, you've straddled virtually two cultures, I mean, being in the States and in India. Uh, so what do you think we in India have to learn from you know, the States, and what can the States also learn from us? Huh? Well, um, I practice in both countries. Um, that's why I tend to compare. Uh, there are pros and cons of both. I mean, we talk a lot about recycling. We talk about a lot of green in, uh, in the United States. But let me tell you one thing. The worst offenders is United States, although I come from there. But uh, the reason because there is a concept of recycling. Because they think there is recycling, they generate more waste. If you just go to walk into McDonald's uh, in the United States, you, one family sitting there has almost one garbage full of uh, plates and boxes and everything. Sometimes I feel uh, poorer countries, I went to Masai Mara, I've been there to Africa several times, I practice in Africa too. Uh, I feel they're really green because they live with the nature. They take very little away from the nature. Like the Maasai tribe, if you look the way they live, uh, that's wonderful. I mean, they just take what they need for that day, and that is truly green. Uh, we in India, somewhere in between that, we still uh, don't use as many disposable plates as uh, the Western world does. I think that's a good part, I mean, because we wash it, and that's recycled. I mean, we're recycling our stuff. But again, we are starting to build a lot of glass buildings. Uh, we, uh, I'm a panelist uh, in a few days uh, as a keynote speaker on one of the ASHRAE events uh, in India. And the emphasis is all on Blue Star and Voltas coming and talking about how they reduced uh, the energy consumption. I said, that is not just being green. Just talking about wattage and kilowatt hours is not being green. Is your process green? And to invite me, they came to my office. I said, you could have sent it by post that is more green. Why did you waste your petrol and come here? I mean, you could just uh, do that. So I practice that in a sense that even in our office, uh, we work only five days a week, uh, Friday, Monday to Friday, we close the Saturday, we extend it by one hour every day. And I said, people commute a lot in India, in Bombay especially, they take three hours to commute from one place to the other. So by just increasing one hour a day, you actually 
cutting your carbon footprint down because you just give Saturday Sundays off. So that's how we practice green. I mean, that's at least a start, if not for anything else. Uh, Abhin, you, you're on a, the biggest position to actually make a difference here. I mean, with the scale of projects that you do. Uh, so what do you think can be done with, with somebody at your, with your company at that level in terms of influencing change? You know, Firstly, I think that, you know, as an architect, uh, as a professional, you got to first do your job best, you know, and that way you contribute to society in the best way. And you got to encourage people, okay, who, like, like what you're doing, like, I, I, I really admire that, that you're getting engaged in a political debate, okay, and you're trying to see that the political debate is informed, okay, with or what they should be informed. And I think that's something as we move on, if we can find time to move out of the sphere, our day-to-day -day sphere and try and either support strongly or actually get fully engaged, okay, in, uh, uh, you know, active societies that are actually trying to push an agenda of change. I think that's something that we should look at doing because there is so much to be done and so much to change. I just came back from a trekking trip to Bhutan. And I was just reflecting, it was so clean, so pristine, et cetera, et cetera. Not as clean and pristine as it was many years ago, okay, but still it was so good compared to Nepal and uh, Gangtok, you know. And uh, then I was wondering, is this an Indianification of, uh, uh, you know, these neighboring countries? Because this country could be so uh, beautiful, so well kept, although all the monasteries and palaces are in use. Still, they are so well kept, so clean, you know, whereas uh, if you go to Nepal, Bhutan or anywhere in India, okay, there's just no civic sense, as Zari, as Zari said. And this goes across society. You know, we look at the beautiful designer home, but even the passage outside and the street that we walk on don't make sense at all. For example, when our politicians come and they ask for their votes, Mr. Loda in our South Mumbai, you know, they come around and say, okay, vote for me. Do we even think, do we even ask them, what's their agenda? Are they going to deliver in those five years a particular agenda to uplift that area? Let's look at that area, that MLA that we are hiring at that local uh, spot. What are we doing about it? Are we questioning him? Are we critically even looking at these things? We are complaining, but are we kind of getting together at our clubs and other dudes, et cetera, and saying, okay, now as a group, we are going to make a push. I think that's the kind of stuff that we have to do. By the way, we have to do it even for the architectural profession. You know, we have to do it for the architectural and engineering profession. We have to do it as society. I think we are, even as architects working in our little, uh, you know, fiefdoms or kingdoms or, uh, you know, mental constructs, and we are not getting out of that. Whereas internationally, you do tend to get out of that and get engaged in other bodies. At least some of the countries that I've worked in, like France, et cetera, people do get engaged in various different pursuits to see that society as a whole benefits from their inputs. So, you know, as architects, I think what we do is only just a drop in the ocean because our problem is far more severe. We had been working with IIT Kanpur and uh, we put up one building where we did the energy valuation. It was actually funded by uh, the MP Lads Fund by Mr. Shauri there. So when we did the next building, we went a step further and we did a green rating. It was a five-star green rated building. It's still, I mean, it's probably one of the very few in the country which is a five-star green rated. So when we finished it, I said, we must demystify this whole thing of green buildings because it's something that all of us are trained to do and it's nothing extra special that we are not in a position to achieve. So we had a day-long seminar and it was in the building itself so people could walk through the building and we had experts talking about it. Subsequently, we also made a film. No, just before that, we made a film about the making of the green building and we also shared it on the conference platform and it was also shown at a lot of schools, government institutions, and that became a basic benchmark to follow. So IIT then used that as a basic benchmark for a lot of other buildings which came up on the campus, which means a lot of the buildings are inherently green.
They also made it mandatory in the government, so it was easy to take it through BE. And a lot of the buildings now have to have a three-star, you know, green rating, which is part of the thing. But all of this, to what I see now, is just a drop in the ocean. Because I think what we are living in our cities is far more complex, and we need to address it far more stringently. You know, I, th I, I don't think we can say, OK, as architects, we are doing it in our buildings, and that's where it ends. It has to go beyond. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we're running out of time. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up. Uh, so if, if this was the last message you're giving to the world and which could influence and change things, what would it be? So one by one. <laughs> I think, uh, especially in India, we need to start thinking about our built environment and civic sense. Like Zari said, it's very, very important. The, the time we start investing more on the exterior and less on the interior, I think our buildings will look really nice and our environment is going to look really nice. Yeah, I believe that uh, you've got to be the change you want to see. So it all begins with you. And uh, in spite of what you see around you, try to be the best human being that you can. And uh, let's hope there will be others that follow. To being not just an architect, but a complete human being in all ways. I think uh, I would suggest that you should enjoy your life. Passionately. Yeah, I think um, we've kind of crossed time and we've all said what all should be said, so I'm going to leave it there. Okay, I think everyone's ready for a little break. So thank you very much for being here and thank you, Pantis. Yeah. Let's have a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for our wonderful panel members. I'm going to request you all to please remain on the stage and if you may please come together for a group photograph. If I may please request all our panel members to come together for a group photograph. And with that, I'd also like to invite Mr. Ketan Trivedi of HR Johnson India to please come on stage to present a memento as a token of gratitude to all of our panel members. I request all our panel members to please remain on the stage. To our speaker, uh, Ms. Tanuja Kanwende. To Mr. Zareer Mulan. To Mr. Sanjay Patil. To Mr. Shekhar Ganti. And to Mr. Abhin Alam Chandani. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you once again to all of our speakers. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much, ma'am. What an interesting session it turned out to be. It was like our panel members were having fun and uh, equally resonating with our panel members were our members of the audience. Absolutely interesting session indeed.